Yes, yeah, Baron and Frankie, thank you so much. Uh, we will get to that story in just a second, but first we wanted to show you what we are seeing out here in the town of Oso. We are at the permanent memorial, uh, and this is officially going to open to the public tomorrow, but we were able to come and see it for ourselves today, and it is very, very breathtaking. So we're encouraging everyone to come out here when they get a chance to see it for themselves. And this is a way to honor those 43 lives lost, but also for people in the community of Oso, Arlington, Darrington to come here and to remember that day, March 22nd, 2014, at 1037 in the morning. That was a Saturday. It changed so many people's lives. Behind David and I, you will see the slide scar from that day. We had tons and tons of debris and sand that came all the way down, wiping out an entire neighborhood. You wiped away homes, wiped away families. Yeah, we're sitting in the area where that neighborhood used to be, and the entrance to this memorial is just off Highway 530, which has been renamed Oso Slide Memorial Highway. Uh, that day, there was a helicopter pilot named Ed Rivnack and his co-pilot. They were out on a training mission uh, for the Snohomish County Helicopter Rescue Team. When they got the call that nobody would have ever imagined they could get, it is unheard of. It's the worst landslide in U.S. history. And I've been friends with Ed for a long time. I'm blessed to know this man. And I've heard stories from him. And I thought that you should hear the stories of the heroism that day, how they downplayed themselves, but what they saw when they first came over that ridge. Take a listen. These are never before released photos showing the devastation from the slide, a scene that was still shifting when the Snohomish County Helicopter Rescue Team first arrived. Ed Rivnack was the co-pilot that day in Snowhawk 10. It was actually uh, overwhelming. And uh, Steve Klett that I was flying with, uh, he knows the area very well. I mean, we've flown up there for years, and I knew the area too. And when we came over, we were looking around. It was like, this isn't right. And I remember Steve going, where's Oso? Houses had exploded. Cars were crushed into small pieces, only the tires remaining. He says it was difficult to process the magnitude. And the other thing that was really hard to figure out is when we, we came into hover to start doing rescues, it was hard to get into hovering position because everything was still moving. And I remember trying to do a hoist and Steve was like, hey, you're drifting. I'm like, no, I'm rock solid. And he said, no, you're... And then I finally realized everything was moving beneath me and it was, it was disorienting. Survivors covered in mud, looking to the skies for help when they heard the sound of the Huey's rotors. There were people that um, they were like putting their hand on their heart and pointing down saying, that's where my family is or that's what I figured they're saying. It's like my house used to be there. Or, this is where I think you know, a family member is. Danger was everywhere. A propane tank venting near the helicopter, not far from a fire. Their rotors churning up debris. Then I saw a piece of insulation pick up and I'm like, hey, we're starting to pick up debris. He said, yep, I got it. And this thing kind of went around in front of us and then got sucked right up into the rotor and exploded into a million pieces. The engine's intake filter caught it. They kept flying, committed. Regardless of the propane, the fire, the, the debris, we're gonna get as many people as we can. That includes a four-year-old boy named Jacob, found up to his knees in concrete-like compressed mud. The only way to get to him was to lower the helicopter down to the skids. There were two guys, two first responders, volunteers, that got to Jacob and were trying to bring him to us, but the mud was just so thick. So uh, there was a massive clay ball there, and Steve was able to bring the aircraft over and just kind of like teeter the skid onto it so our rescuer, Randy, could get out and get down to him. The mud packed so tightly around his little body, his pants came off when he was pulled out. Seeing a little kid come in about the same uh, size and age of my daughter. That was tough. Jacob had been home with his father, a chief petty officer with the U.S. Navy, and his three siblings. He was the only survivor. He said he didn't cry. I think he was too shocked, but he said he didn't cry. That's Jacob's mom. She'd been at the store when the slide hit. It's just awesome. They found him. Just seeing all that stuff out there, because I'd been out there a few times to see the site, and just to know where we lived and where they found him, it's just... Unbelievable. As luck would have it, the Snowhawk 10 crew had already been flying a training mission that morning when they got the radio call for help. We were the first aircraft on scene, and in that first fuel cycle, at first hour and a half on station, we, uh, we rescued eight people. They'd risked a lot to save a lot. 
By nightfall, they'd recovered 12 people alive. As more resources arrived, three more were lifted to safety. As things unfolded, more aircraft came in. Airlift Northwest came in. We set up a landing zone. Woodby Island came in. And we started doing this round robin because we had the rescue hoist. And so we could hoist someone and take it to the LZ, transfer to airlift, and go. And, and I can remember one person that we transferred to them, they ended up doing CPR right there on the, on, in the grass uh, because the person was so unstable and so severely injured. Ed says it was reminiscent of his time in Iraq where he served two tours as a flight nurse. When he thinks back to what happened here 10 years ago, he downplays his role. I think the real heroism I saw was the town of Oso, the Oso Fire Department. You know, we, we were working with guys who had lost loved ones and they were still working. The helicopter rescue team stayed on scene for the next six weeks to fly support for those rescuers, sometimes so exhausted they needed a lift out. Mostly, Ed remembers how the community came together. And to see it go from one volunteer fire department, one helicopter, and the expansion in a short amount of time, it, it, it's like, wow. To see that organization and know that we have that capability, that we can do that, um, it's, it's reassuring to me that if that happens again, if something like OSO happens again in Washington State, I know we're ready for it because we proved it there at OSO. I asked Ed in the years since if he's talked to any of the volunteers or some of the family members about what they thought when the helicopters came over, and he said it's interesting. He said, I've heard from many of the people who were out here who say that they like the noise of the helicopter of the rotors because it reminds them of rescue, of help is coming. But he's also heard from family members of the people who were killed who said they can't stand to hear the sound of those rotors because it reminds them of the tragedy and what they heard every day for six mm -hmm. weeks as those helicopters worked on some of the rescue operations. So uh, we're grateful to have teams like this. The Snohomish County Helicopter Rescue Team still in action every single day out there saving lives. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that image of Jacob being hoisted up and saved. Oh, it's just, I, I, it's, I just almost break down every yeah. time I see that. Yeah. It is so yeah. emotional. It, and is, it is so emotional. It's so yeah. grateful. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk to Jacob about this, but we certainly hope that he's doing well. Yeah, and you know, Jacob lost his siblings and his dad, and you know, there are 43 lives lost. And here at this permanent memorial, we have um, beautiful uh, statues here and plaques that are dedicated to them. So we're gonna show you that in a little bit later in the show. And also we have a special coming up. It's a one hour special dedicated, uh, you know, tomorrow at 7 p.m. to mark the 10 year mark.